welcome to the National Multicultural Interpreting Project. This is one in a series of presentations that are going to be addressing interpreting in the culturally and linguistically diverse communities. This presentation is going to be focusing on multicultural interpreting, the setting, the team, and also exploring what do we mean when we're talking about a culturally linguistic diverse interpreter. First, what I'd like to do is introduce the panelists, and each one will be discussing and sharing their perspectives, their experiences with us, and uh, I want them to introduce themselves. One thing I want you to keep in mind, though, that is due to the nature of this particular presentation, um, and out of respect for cultural and linguistic diversity, each presenter has chosen to communicate in the mode and the language that he or she feels most comfortable and most appropriate for this particular uh, session we're having now. So first, I'd like to turn it over. Our first presenter. Oh, sure. Chi, on hui yata, jalagi. Agichi, ani jishkwa. Agidode, echi, ani gilahi. Kohisa, eh. Agichi, ta line. In introducing myself just now in Indian Sign Language, basically what I related was a greeting and identified myself as Cherokee and my clan being the bird clan and my father's clan being that of the long hair. And that also, I was later ceremonially adopted and have a crow mother. I've been interpreting for over 20 somewhat years professionally. And I'm professionally the last five. Hi, my name is Jan Nishimura. I'm a sansei, third generation Japanese American. I was born and raised in Chicago. As I was growing up, my grandmother lived with us, so I grew up listening to Japanese. I don't speak Japanese. My mother used to laugh and say my pronunciation was so bad that I could only speak to deaf people who weren't having to listen to the accent or the pronunciation. I've been a professional interpreter now for about 25 years. I've been in the field for a couple of years longer than that. Hi, my name is Jackie Bruce. I'm an African-American. I've been in the field of interpreting for about 16 years now. I have an aunt who's deaf, and I have learned a lot from her. So we're here to let you know a lot what we know. Some more panelists for today's presentation are... Hello. My name is Jonathan Hopkins. I am Native American. My nation of people are known as the Clinkets. I've been involved in the interpreting profession for 11 years, and my mode of communication will be spoken English. Hello, my name is Anthony Aaron Bureau from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm African American and my mode of communication for this presentation is spoken English. Hola, mi nombre es Yolanda Zavala, nacida y creada aquí en El Paso, Texas. Mis padres descendientes de México. Mi primer idioma es español, pero voy a usar, uh, voy a utilizar el, el inglés. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Davis. I'm the European American representative of the Multicultural Interpreting Team. Um, I grew up in the New Orleans, Louisiana area and now live in Miami, Florida. My family is of British, Irish, Welsh descent, and they've been here 12 generations in North America. I've been involved in the interpreting profession for 25 years as an interpreter and as an interpreter educator. Hello, and I'm Angela Roth. My parents are from Puerto Rico. I was born and raised in New York, which makes me a Eurekan. My first language is Spanish. My second language is English. Eventually, I had a little French, a little German, and as an adult, I fell in love with American Sign Language. For today's presentation, though, I've chosen to speak in English. And I've been practicing in the profession of sign language now for about 18 years. The first thing we want to talk about is what do we mean when we say a multicultural interpreting, be it a team or whether it be a culturally diverse uh, individual. 
At this point, we want to take a historical perspective, and for that, we're going to turn to Tupper, Jan, and Jackie. A historical perspective of interpreters in Indian country is that there's been a loss of trust. And that was after the European invasion. There was a famous Indian chief by the name of uh, Plintiku from the Crow Nation. And there was a biographer who was interviewing him via Indian Sign Language, communicating directly with him without the assistance of an interpreter. Plinico expressed appreciation for this, saying that he felt more comfort relating his life story without going through an interpreter because they spoke with four tongues. That's the way it was transcribed. Uh, you should understand, though, that uh, the sign generally translated as fork tongue has a number of meanings, not only lying or falsehoods, but making mistakes or tricking people, and has a number of meanings. Now, from a dominant culture perspective, there was a military officer by the name of William P. Clark. And in his writings, he stated that uh, interpreters were the cause for all of the disruption and miscommunications and had uh, ruined all Indian white relations uh, for quite some time and were notorious for that. So actually, uh, interpreters today are pretty reticent about trusting interpreters. Now for me personally, I grew up in a number of different cultures. Which means that I'm half Cherokee and half white, and I grew up in both both worlds. Also, having deaf parents, I grew up in deaf and hearing worlds. I also moved all over the country growing up, so I understand a southern perspective and a northern perspective, east coast, west coast, and and uh, everything in between. Sometimes I lived in predominantly black neighborhoods and tried to fit in with that culture, or other times in Latino neighborhoods, and so forth, or in Jewish communities, always trying my best to fit in. Of course, I never really did perfectly, but at least it gave me some adaptability and receptiveness that helped me when I became an interpreter. I think that was uh, of great assistance to me when I became an interpreter. I grew up in... Uh, in these different worlds, different cultures, and, and values. So, for example, Indian people generally use family members to interpret for them today, and generally the younger ones, because the, the elders um, quite often will be disfluent in English. And that's just expected. There's, there's no uh, order of a the, of the young one to do so. They just might relate that there's a, a need to do something, and extended family members will take the initiative on their own to prepare uh, for the event. And maybe the whole family will caravan down. We understand they're very family oriented. And they will interpret for whatever situation, whether it be medical or whatever. The time that I was growing up, uh, deaf people didn't use interpreters very often. They most generally used their children. But it was a different kind of system, if you will. For example, there wasn't any real telephone interpreting, per se. Generally, my parents would ask me if I would mind going to the neighbors and placing a call for them. And they would write down the phone number and a message, and I would go over there and ask if I could use the phone, placing the call, and relating that I was calling for my parents and returning with a response. Then, of course, my parents would say, oh, no, you need to sell them something else. And I will go through the whole process again. And of course, I interpreted for everything, whether it be mechanics or doctors or whatever. Even if I was hurt myself, one time I had something stuck up in my foot, and I was taking bawling to the hospital. And of course, inter hospitals never provided interpreting services in those days. The doctor expected me to do so on my own. So, so I tried to hold back my sobbing and would sign to my parents. And then as my parents related their response, I would be 
uh, trying to figure out what they were saying before relating it, and the doctor would be uh, impatient for my, my translation. And when, when it was all over, then I finally was able to finish my crying. That's generally the way things went. I never thought about getting into it as a profession or a career uh, un until later. When interpreting actually became a profession, I was interested but was reticent because, as I said, we don't trust interpreters. And also, uh, many anecdotes related to me from the deaf community about their disdain for hearing people who had taken advantage of them. They might tell a hearing friend, I'm going to the doctor tomorrow, and they would ask, be asked, who's your interpreter? Oh, no, I'm just going to write notes, or my child's going to interpret for me. And, uh, and they would be very adamant that they needed to have a professional interpreter. And that was a new concept that had to be defined for them. And even though that they might be reticent for to do that, uh, they were finally pressured into doing so, deferring to these hearing people. And they appreciated the interpreter services, but afterwards were presented with a bill. And they were aghast at that, felt that they had been taken advantage of and hadn't been, uh, uh, and that the interpreters hadn't been upfront with them about that. And that was very displeasing. And when later on we found out that various agencies and entities would pay for interpreters, I decided to get into an interpreter training program. Now, from getting into that profession, I, it was very obvious that I wouldn't be able to, to go at it from my own cultural paradigms, manner of speech or dress or anything like that. But I was pretty used to adapting to dominant culture all of my life and the various cultures and so forth. I worked on enhancing my, my English skills and so forth to match the norm. And in the interpretive training program, they didn't really talk about divulged cultures at that time. They, might, they talked a little bit about black American sign language, but very superficially. And if you actually wanted to learn anything about the various subcultures in the deaf community, you had to take the initiative to do that on your own. There were a number of times I went into uh, deaf service agencies and asked for about the, uh, the black people in the deaf community, and, was, and the response was that there weren't any. So, and all they were out there. You had to go on your own and find them. And the same thing in Indian country. At any rate, I still at that time didn't feel culture, felt it was culturally appropriate to actually act and speak in a manner of my own culture. It wasn't until later I started meeting other interpreters of color and that I was able to feel more comfortable about that and, and saw that it was really a better way to provide services to those communities, and that was a relief. I took my first sign language class back in the early 1970s. At that time, it was called manual communication. I started learning how to sign, and I started meeting deaf people who wanted access to information, but there were no interpreters per se at that time. So the deaf people that I would meet and become friends with would ask me to interpret for them. And when I asked them, what does interpreting mean, they would say, oh, well, um, it means that hearing people talk, you sign. And at that time, I only had a very limited amount of vocabulary, but their feeling was better than nothing. I'm getting a little bit of information. And so I progressed. I acquired ASL by interacting with members of the deaf community who were very patient with me and invited me to join with them in their activities. I always say that my own personal development as an interpreter paralleled the growth and the development of the interpreting profession. As I became more aware of my role and what my responsibilities and implications of my behaviors were in the interpreting field, so too was the interpreting field coming out with guidelines and roles, rules, responsibilities, and the code of ethics. At that time, we were considered interpreters for people, deaf people, whether they be users of American Sign Language or users of Sign Exact <coughs> English, whether they be oral, deaf, blind. We were expected to serve the people. We were expected to know everything and to be everything to everybody. And our focus at that time were the deaf people, not so much the hearing consumers in the setting, not so much the audience. And at that time, I don't think we were, we were even aware of who we were and how we fit into 
this scenario. As the years progressed, however, we realized that we could not be a combo interpreter, as I was called when I went to my first deaf convention. Um, they were very specific in saying this is a tactile interpreter, but you're a combo, meaning that you do whatever needs to be done at the time. And so that's how we thought of ourselves. But as the field grew, as I said, we became more aware of how the interpreter, how the interpreter's personality, knowledge, persona affected the interpreting situation. So we began realizing that an interpreter for a deaf woman in an OBGYN appointment would, of course, need to be a female interpreter. So we became sensitive to, aware of, and started making deliberate placements and choices in issues related to gender, in issues related to language, whether it be American Sign Language, C, modes of communication, tactile, oral interpreting. And then with respect to um, situations, topics, and subject matter. I think that the next field that we're looking into is that of the multicultural situations, <coughs> situations involving deaf people from other cultures, or where anything within that situation carries with it a cultural component. I first entered the field about uh, 16 years ago, and during that time, most of the interpreters that were utilized were of European descent. There were a number of African Americans uh, working, uh, possibly at churches, and they also were working in the community, but not many of them were working in the professional arena. Most of us may recall Shirley Childress Johnson from D.C., and for me, even the first person that I saw interpreting was an African American from California by the name of Brenda Lacasse. Now we're becoming more aware of sign language used by the African American deaf community, and we must understand what's going on there. For example, the sign for perm. In my culture, we use the word perm. It's a chemical that's used to straighten the hair, and it's different when other people think it's to make the hair curly. In the past five to six years, I've also seen a drastic increase in the number of African American interpreters becoming certified and even interpreting within the general community. As more people from culturally diverse communities enter the field, it can only strengthen our profession. We definitely bring with us specific cultural knowledge and understanding, as well as a willingness to work with everyone, the teachers, the educators, the consumers, as well as the trainers in order to provide the best possible service that we can. So from a historical perspective, what we can glean from this is as the deaf communities become much more up to the fore of their own identities and needs, it means that our profession as interpreters have also had to kind of follow along and be much more aware, much more sensitive to those needs and how we're providing the services. That also means then that understanding the multicultural needs and appreciating the cultural linguistic diversity that interpreters from those communities bring, not just putting them in token settings. Now the question we want to consider, are there situations where being a cultural, linguistic, diversity background interpreter makes a difference, and are there situations where it doesn't? If the answer is yes, then we have to consider when do we make the choices as to when a person should be there to cover that uh, diversity and when it's not. So let's consider that and let's turn over to Yolanda first. Uh, sometimes it's very important to consider uh, a situation. Uh, there are times when you can do team interpreting and there are times when the consumer can relate to the interpreter due to the fact that they're of the same culture, the language, and they can relate to each other. For example, my experience has been that I have gone out to interpret and the consumer right away can relate to me because of my language. And if they tend to code switch, they know that I can't easily follow their mode of communication. For example, like I said in the beginning, uh, my first language is Spanish, and my second is English. And here in our community, we tend to do a lot of code switching. And that's where effect and, and the culture and the sensitivity comes into effect 
where I can code switch just the same as the consumer. They could sign in American Sign Language and mouth English or Spanish. However, um, most of our consumers, as we, as I myself have experienced, uh, we tend to relate to those that are of our same culture and language. But again, being open about all these settings is very important when you are a multicultural language interpreter. Thank you. The situation where I could see where it wouldn't matter, and I'll use the example of an African American speaker, uh, an individual who incorporates in their presentation um, cultural nuances, uh, head movements, body language, information that's pertinent to that particular culture, an inv individual coming from that particular background will be able to understand the movements and know how to interpret that and understand when it's appropriate to use that and what tone or affect is given by that. Uh, code switching from standard English to black English vernacular, you know, when is it on a formal register or when is it informal, um, the production of how that speaker is presenting that information, be it English or black English vernacular, uh, and an individual with that innate um, understanding of when that is used would be real appropriate in that situation. Um, also the use of uh, particular words that are in this instance, the names that are uh, innate to the African American community, names such as Sade being spelled S A D E, or the spellings of Erica, uh, E Y R I C A instead of E I R I C A, uh, Aisha, uh, male names, the names that are in the profession, uh, Deshaun, you know, how we spell those. Uh, some common, some names just being familiar with individuals uh, who are given those names and things like that are real pertinent. And also when a speaker refers to situations that are common within that community, um, current events that are happening on black entertainment television, or current stories that are in Ebony or Essence, Emerge, or Jet Magazine, those type of things. Individuals who come from a cultural background ha that have that information uh, would be appropriate in a situation like that because they would, as one of my um, co-interpreters said earlier, um, Jackie Bruce, that they have a good interpretation, an accurate interpretation. And coming from that culturally and linguistic background, they could give that. Now, a situation where it would not matter is if you had an African-American speaker who's speaking on a particular topic that's of a general nature, where the information that they're talking about, say, uh, if they're explaining how to change a battery in a car, or if they're giving information on how to bake a cake, something that's not of cultural and linguistic significance, where they're just presenting information, while well, an interpreter of any background uh, could do justice to that, uh, and not, not necessarily, in that instance, a lot of cultural or linguistic uh, elements will be brought to the forefront in a particular uh, setting as that. number of factors to take into consideration. One of them might be whether the, the deaf Indian person who grew up on a reservation or, or in an urban environment, went to an Indian school, um, to a residential school for the deaf, or, or whatever. An interpreter might see them using American Sign Language and think they have no problem understanding, and yet not recognize that there's code switching going on between American Sign Language and Indian Sign Language, and thus uh, misinterpreting false cognates. If I could back up for a minute. You know, the norm in deaf culture is to point uh, with your fingers, and that's considered more than rude in Indian country for a number of reasons with a number of uh, negative connotations. So instead, pointing will be done with your lips and chin. An exception might be amongst the Lakota who may point sometimes with a little finger or thumbs, if you're talking about inanimate objects, but never when talking about another person. And uh, people that use uh, reservation dialects of American Sign Language might appear to be completely missing their pronouns. Amongst their peers, they may point as either way with uh, their chin or lips, and yet when an interpreter from dominant culture comes in, they don't do that so much, and the pronouns appear to be missing, and they fill in by gestalt having misinterpretations. And 
there is more than I can get into about the uh, differences in what facial affect mean. I'd like to relate a story about an Indian event one time where there was only one native in the interpreting team. And there wasn't really any cooperation between them. Uh, they weren't receptive to any direction or mentorship that he might give about the way things should be done in a native event and took control, causing a lot of problems. He acquiesced to them, but there were a lot of conflicts. There was no spirit of cooperation. And yet, at another time, there was an integrated team in uh, Canada at another Native event. And the, the Anglo interpreters came in and started talking about timing and turn taking and so forth. And the Indian interpreters ref responded that, uh, that there were other things to take in consideration that took priority, uh, matching up uh, gender being matching up and being gender specific in some cases or uh, be having deference to age and others and so forth and whether or not even certain portions could be interpreted or not. There are some things that cannot be interpreted into English from a, a native language um, because they, they lose their power. For example, if you had a, a medicine person uh, offering a prayer in an Indian way and doing that in Indian Sign Language. Are you allowed to voice that? You can't interpret it into English, and you can't interpret it in ASL either. And by the same token, if it's a spoken Indian language, you might be able to do so in Indian Sign Language if you have permission. So it's important to have the permission of the one offering the blessing before you're able to interpret such a thing and in sign language. So this group was very flexible and very cooperative and had a great spirit. The Indian interpreters were able to learn from them about the geography and sign differences in Canada, and they were able to learn from the, from the native interpreters, and there was a great spirit amongst the team where they learned and understood from one another. And the deaf people felt respected as well. And so they had a special dance where they sang an honor song and asked the interpreters to lead, to, to honor them for what they had done because they were so appreciative uh, of them despite whatever their cultural backgrounds were. Well, I had a situation occur. At that time, it was important to have an interpreter of color now, as I mentioned before, my background is Spanish, but I'm a dark Hispanic, so a lot of people think that I'm African-American, which is cool. So I was called for an assignment that had to do interpreting for a, a Martin Luther King uh, celebration, and there was a lot of gospel music and things going on. And I could follow that. My artistic interpreting skills, that, would, that matched the situation perfectly. My team partner happened to be someone who was Euro-American, white, and that worked fine when we did the songs. But what happened was at the end of this program, they went to what's called the Black Anthem. Now, I don't know it. I'm not African American. I had the look, but I didn't know how to sign it. Ironically, it was my partner who was white. He knew the words, and he knew how to sign it. But he looked at me and said, I cannot be the person standing in front doing that. It's impossible. And I'm looking at him saying, but I don't know the words. He said, there is no way that in front of this entire uh, African-American black audience that I'm going to stand as a white person and do the national, the black national anthem. It's just not appropriate. And so I had to struggle through it. I didn't have the skills, but in that particular situation, it would have been a complete insult to the community had, um, had, I, you know, had he been the one to do it. And I mean, I learned a lesson. I mean, after that, it's like, whenever I go in a situation like this, to be fully prepared, and I, and I really wasn't. That was my fault. But there's an example where, again, the look was critical and would have been insulting to the community had anybody else done it. Which brings us then to consider that we have to look at several factors. Yes, it does make a difference in some situations. In some situations, it doesn't. 
How do we know the difference? Well, we can see from the comments that were made and the stories that were shared, there are two factors we first want to consider. One is cognitive. We need to know and understand the culture. It might be uh, the vocabulary, the words, the background. And a lot of that we can learn about another culture. Or we can have a partner, a team partner, who could feed that information and be there ready to help us with that. However, there's a second part. A second part has to do with the affect. Affect is something that you get from a life experience. And if you haven't been in that culture, if that hasn't been a part of your life sufficiently, then if you try and pull off the affect, you start looking like you're mimicking or making fun of the culture. So that part is very touchy, and that's where we really want to look to a, a multicultural interpreter to be there. The other factors we would want to consider is, as you can see what that was brought out in the stories, has to do with comfort level. And there are three entities that we have to consider. The comfort level of the interpreter. I've talked with interpreters around the country who have admitted that they wish they had not done an assignment and how uncomfortable they were. These were Euro-American white interpreters that did not have the background and they wished that there was somebody there that they could have turned the assignment over to or had worked with them. The second comfort level has to do with the presenter. A presenter may have information that is so culturally embedded in their presentation, they need to feel that they have an interpreter that can move with them. If they decide to go into something that is very culturally rich, that the interpreter has the skills and give the presenter the freedom to be able to be themselves and be able to bring that information out clearly. And the third would be then the audience itself, our other consumers. There are situations where we have to be aware of the community's needs to be able to recognize and have have what we would say a credibility with the audience by an, an interpreter that really represents that community. So those are factors we'd want to look at. But perhaps we're sitting here wondering now, okay, if I am not from a particular culture, what about me? Does that mean I just have to stay out, that I can't go and interpret in another community that is different from mine? And the question then comes up, what factors, what strategies, what skills would I have to consider before accepting such an assignment? So addressing that question of, I'm not from that culture, what about me? If I go solo into assignment or if I'm teaming, what can I do? Let's have some live experiences and thoughts on that. I first started in interpreting in 1973, and that's when the first federal legislation was passed. It was called 504. That's the precursor to the American Disabilities Act. And at that time, um, the top certification offered by our national organization was the Comprehensive Skills Certification, the CSC. And in a way, that meant if you obtained a CSC was you were able to interpret in a wide variety of settings with many different topics involving many participants from a variety of backgrounds. My first interpreting job was with the Texas Commission for the Deaf in Austin. And my work there brought me around the state of Texas but I frequently found myself along the borders of the United States and Mexico. And in those contexts, frequently, we would see individuals from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds. The way we worked with it then to achieve um, appropriate interpreting was we'd bring in spoken language interpreters and also deaf interpreters who came from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And the same is true in communities like Washington, D.C., where I worked for a long time, or now in Miami. The challenge, I guess, is, is certainly for us to bring this model back to our classrooms. And how do we bring this to our profession as a whole when we're teaching workshops at a national level? It's involving a certain model for team interpreting together and strategies for achieving this. I think often students think of culture as the, the clothes people wear and the food but there are a lot more dynamics than that. So our, we really have a great challenge, but you know, it is happening, and this has been a great you know, opportunity to develop these strategies. Not being a member of the same ethnic background when it comes to multicultural interpreting is an interesting strategy to try to develop within an interpreter. I myself, being Native American, have been involved within the black deaf community, the Hispanic deaf community, and the Asian deaf community within the, the 11 years that I've been involved in the profession. When I first came in through the training program um, as a student, I was aware that I was the only Native American student in the program, as well as probably the only Native American on the whole college campus. Not having access to my 
people or my culture or other organizations. There was only one organization that was established on the campus, and that was a black student organization. I got involved with that, and from that, I got involved with the Hispanic Deaf organizations, as well as the black Deaf organizations. And through my training and through my just being actively involved in different cultures, I became more culturally sensitive, much more culturally educated about these different organizations. I know that Jackie had mentioned earlier in her portion about the number of African American interpreters that are out there. Um, when I graduated from the program, and since I've been involved in the profession, the numbers have been growing. But at that time when I was completing the program, I was one of very few quote unquote interpreters and transliterators of color. So I was constantly requested to do a lot of variety of events. I know that Angie had mentioned about the fact that when she was asked to do the National Black Anthem, fortunately for me, I knew the Black National Anthem and was able to do that in a variety of settings. I also know that being involved in these different cultures and organizations has helped me as an individual grow professionally, internally, personally, spiritually. I know that uh, one situation that I was involved with was when I had gone to a gospel concert. And I'm not black. Um, I did not grow up in a uh, Baptist church. I do not um, claim to be a Christian. Um, however, I was requested to do this gospel concert. And after that one time of doing that, I was constantly requested to do it thereafter. And one of the main reasons why they said that I why they requested me to do this was because I had rhythm. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of other events that I've been, had an opportunity to, to interpret. Um, and I think a lot of it doesn't necessarily have to do with the person's background. I think it has to do with the person's being able to be culturally sensitive and be, to be aware and to be open to these learning environments. The demographics have shown on college campuses and throughout the United States that the number of quote unquote minorities is increasing especially within the black deaf, Hispanic deaf, and Asian deaf, and Native American deaf communities on college campuses. And therefore, we as a profession need to grow along with the demographics. Uh, when we become more multiculturally sensitive and more aware and educated about these different ethnic backgrounds and ethnic um, groups, we can do a better job of servicing these different groups of people. Thank you. I think that a multicultural approach to interpreting takes on a number of different perspectives and things to look for. I know in my own 25 plus years of interpreting, I've often been bemused that I look the part, but I may not be who I am. Having grown up as a third generation Japanese American, I exhibit more American characteristics than I do Japanese characteristics. Yet because of the appearance, people will assume that I know a great deal about the Asian Pacific Island um, culture. I remember being in Japan and I was going to do some interpreting at an international conference and all the deaf Japanese came up to me excitedly and started speaking Japanese. And I had to learn very quickly how to say in Japanese that I'm a sansei and my grandmother was from Shikoku and go into my history. So at least I could respond with that one statement. But I also see that when I've worked with deaf people from Asian countries, there's been, because of the appearance, uh, been a bond. It's perhaps been easier for me to negotiate communication with them than it has been for some of my other colleagues. I remember one situation where I was specifically put on an assignment because the deaf presenter was from Hawaii. And during her presentation, she was planning to talk about the geography of Hawaii, talking about the different islands, the um, traditions, the volcanoes. And I remember dying every time she fingerspelled the name of a volcano, the name of a site, the name of a town, because I didn't have a clue as to how to pronounce it. I had done my pre-conferencing, but I didn't expect to, once I got in the chair and had the microphone in hand, to be faced with this need. So it later became a videotape, and I've had to apologize to anyone who I might think might be seeing that videotape for not doing a good job on the pronunciation of the Hawaiian terms. Similarly, I think that any time you approach a situation from a multicultural perspective, every situation is multi-layered and multifaceted, and it's difficult to assign any particular characteristic or need to any one feature. For example, I was interpreting in a situation involving a deaf male from Iran, and his wife, who was a deaf male, 
from India. One of the doctors in the situation was a hearing doctor from China, who was a Chinese American, and then there was me. Well, both the deaf people were immigrants. I didn't know how long they had been in the United States. Both exhibited a fluency in, in a sign language that I didn't understand. But because of our appearance and because of how we were all postured in the situation, I think there were expectations, perhaps, of the doctor looking at me, thinking that I must be taking care of this couple. And then there were expectations of me in terms of how this doctor was going to relate to the patient. In that situation, I realized that I was out of my element, and I did call and ask that a relay interpreter be provided. Fortunately, it was a deaf male interpreter. And culturally, from um, addressing the Middle Eastern culture of males over females, that male relay interpreter was able to get information that I perhaps was not able to get. I also had to recognize that there were some limits to how effective I could be in that situation because there were elements that neither interpreter or nobody in that situation had full capacity to provide. You know, as interpreters, when we get into those situations and we realize that we're in over our head and we've realized it too late and we're doing the best we can, there comes a time when we have to recognize this is what I need and this is what I don't have. I also have this philosophy anytime I've been in one of these traumatic situations that one day this situation will become funny and the only way to get through it is to imagine myself telling the story. I also think of it as this is one more lesson in my kit bag. This is one more lesson on my way to crondom. So if I'm going to become old, I would like to become wise. Mm -hmm. So it's a story, it's a lesson that's going to help teach me something. We've been talking about culture and linguistic diversity from an ethnic racial point of view, but I would like to maintain that any situation, any group, any entity, any religion, any group of people has shared experiences and can be thought of as having its own culture. I was called to interpret for a conference of mostly deaf people, and so much of the interpreting was voice interpreting. I was voicing one workshop where I had pre-conferenced with the speaker, and I understood his presentation. I knew where he was going with it, so I felt fairly comfortable. The part that I didn't expect was when the presenter started calling people from the audience to present their, to give their life experiences. During the conference, I knew that I had had some experience with difficulty with certain terminology and needing to look for someone who could help me with this terminology. Well, we got to this one part of the presentation, and this one individual was telling his story. And what he signed went something like this. I voiced that as, I grew up in a residential school for the deaf, and every Saturday my teachers told me I had to go to jail. Now, this little part back here was saying, now, why would they have to go to jail? You know, interpreters, we also have to make inferences and figure out situations or make up situations. So I said, ah, okay, I'm from Chicago. It's a big city, and we have a program called Scared Straight, where high school kids are brought to the jails and the police precincts so that they know how to stay out of, that they know they should stay out of trouble because this is what's going to happen to them. This is what's going to happen to them. So it made a certain amount of sense to me that he was being kept out of trouble that way. This was a scenario in my mind. And then the deaf person went on to say, so I voiced that as, one Saturday my father came to visit me and I was so excited because I thought, great, I'm gonna be able to spend time with my father. But my teacher told me that I still had to go to jail. Now, my alter ego back here is saying, wow, this is a really strict school. Now, in the back, there were about maybe 200 people in this audience. I can hear some rumblings. So my uncertainty about the accuracy of the information is now being supported by the idea that there are people who are uncomfortable. I bet they're hearing people, and I bet that they're telling me that I'm not going down the right path. The next part was... And the voicing for that became, 
So I went into the building, walked down the hall, went into the closet, and shut the door. <laughs> okay, now I know this is not making any sense at all. At that point, I stood up, I asked the speaker if I could stop, I explained I was having difficulty, and I stood up in front of all these people said, I'm sorry, the interpreter is not understanding the information. Is there a person here who could sit next to me, who understands the signs, who could sit next to me and tell me what the words are? I, I will be responsible for the voicing, but I just need to know what certain words are. And so I looked around, people were not volunteering. Finally, one hand came up, and so I was very grateful. This gentleman sat down, he was in blue jeans and a t-shirt, and very comfortable looking. He sat next to me, and he says, oh, Jan, by the way, that was confession. He was going to confession, not jail. Oh, he was going to confession, not jail. Rewind, let's start this again. So, the interpretation then became, our area, our church, our church, our congregation was so small that we didn't have a permanent table, no altar. We didn't have a permanent altar. So what we had was a portable altar on which we put some beads, no, rosary, on which we put the rosary. <laughs> and so the interpretation proceeded with me and the microphone getting to a certain part where I knew that what I was going to voice probably had another word, leaning over, having the gentleman feed me the word, and then my proceeding with the interpretation. And that's how I got through the assignment. Hmm. When all was said and done, I thanked the gentleman, and I was pretty excited about what I had done, thinking that, well, the message came out clearly. I felt good about having somebody give me the words that I needed so that I knew that priests got vested instead of priests got dressed, they get vested. So now I have a, a broader vocabulary. And uh, so I was very excited and I shared that with my colleague. And as we introduced ourselves, I found out that he was a Catholic priest. <laughs> so I don't know whether I should have, if my final reaction should have been mortification that I, it was a priest who was helping me with this assignment or it was, if, it would, if it, would, it should still be the exhilaration that I encountered a problem or I encountered a difficulty and was able to solve it with a strategy wherein I knew that the both of us working together provided the interpretation that needed to be given. So recapping on what we said on these fascinating stories is that if we do not belong to a particular cultural, diverse, linguistic, or culture from other perspectives, as Jan brought out, what do we do? Well, first of all, we know by our code of ethics, we really should advocate to make sure that the best person, the best fit, can go on that assignment. And we know that we should use discretion before ac accepting a job if we really do not have the skill for it. On the other hand, there is cognitive information we can build on. We can learn about the culture. We can learn the language. We can learn the specific terminology. We can learn the protocol. These are things that we can learn. Just as we've learned about deaf culture, we can learn about the varieties within the cultures that we live in. The affect is always one that's a touchy one. We don't want to try and put on and put on a black African-American affect because, again, it looks like we're mimicking or making fun of the culture. That's really not what's needed. What we do find is needed is attitudinal behaviors, behaviors that can be seen, that are identifiable. We've called this among the multicultural interpreting team, it. Does a person have it? There are behaviors that show a person's attitudes, and in another videotape, another series of information, we'll be able to talk more about it. But these are behaviors and attitudes that show that we have respect and that we really do appreciate the culture that we're working within. In fact, as we close up now and we talk about what is a multicultural interpreting setting, a multicultural interpreter, a culturally, linguistically diverse interpreter, let's look to see if we can pick out some of those attitudes and behaviors that's what's going to make us accessible to other cultures. To me, multicultural interpreting means that we're all in this together and that I don't have to be super interpreter. It involves a lot of teamwork and it involves us working closely together to achieve greater understanding of what is meant by culture, race, and ethnicity. And perhaps most importantly, it means valuing one's own cultural identity. To me, multicultural interpreting, first and foremost, means having respect for your own culture as well as for another individual's culture, no matter what their background may be or their ethnicity. I think having 
sensitivity and cultural awareness for that individual and for the groups of people that we work with is very val valued and important, especially in our profession. I think also just basically having a really good, positive, open attitude, being open to the other people's cultures, being open to learning, and becoming an educated person so that we can serve the wide variety of people that we, that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. To me, it means approaching every situation from a holistic point of view, to recognize <coughs> that every person has strengths, skills, and abilities that they bring to that situation. It means looking at everything from a cultural perspective, looking at the players, the participants, and considering each one of those elements and their implications. It also means to me that I can be the sum total of each part of my identity. That each part of my identity, my Japanese background, uh, my growing up in Chicago in the Midwest, every, every facet of who I am plays an important role in what I can bring professionally to the job. It means that I accept myself in who I am, that in whatever I do, I try my best, I do my best, but that I'm always open to new information. For me, it just means understanding the background and culture, the affect, and the language. It doesn't matter who they are, whether they're hearing or deaf. And it also means that we have to work together for a common goal, and that goal is being sure that we have an accurate interpretation of the message. What would be critical in multicultural interpreting? Primarily would be adaptability. And being able to break free of our old paradigms and how we were educated or trained or and as interpreters or what we've learned from our colleagues in mentorship so that we can better uh, match up the needs of those that we serve. And acculturation would also be very important, to be able to learn about various cultures and understand them and respect them. You don't see that many uh, interpreters of color, and often you might not see de uh, deaf people of color at, out there in the community, but we're not being required to become a member of those communities, but just to learn about them and respect them. Something else that would be important, too, is working together as teams. There are many deaf people in communities of color that are hesitant about outsiders coming in as interpreters. And if you come in with a team member from their own culture, then they might be able to put their guard down and see that this person is actually an ally, and that makes all the difference. Multicultural interpreting for me is difficult to define depending on the situation, but from my per perspective, acknowledgement of the person, of the individual, is so, so vital. Their language, their culture, their background, their understanding of the communication mode. Just being uh, multilingual in itself has helped me tremendously as far as being able to switch from one language to another here in El Paso, we have those situations. And I tend to relate to consumers that are multilingual, the Spanish and English. For example, if they um, start uh, communicating with me through American Sign Language and then they code switch to Spanish and English, then simple situations like como estas, vamonos a la cafeteria, all that might seem like slang, but that is a multicultural uh, situation that happens constantly here on our border. And being multilingual means accepting the other person for who they are and culturally aware of their needs. Thank you. Multicultural interpreting would be an individual who would possess cognitive and affective skills um, linguistically and culturally 
um, possessing those skills and a willingness to become a part of that culture, to learn as much as you can about a particular culture, and then convey that information in an appropriate and accurate manner. And I believe that multicultural interpreting is reality. It's the reality of the world that we live in today. It's the reality of who we are and who we can be. It's the reality of who we work with. It's the reality of the people that we serve in our profession. It really is the reality of who we are growing as professionals. And the only way that we can grow as professionals is facing the reality that we have to grow as people. Thank you.